Uh, the 52 greatest chapters of the Bible. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, those of you, how many of you were not here last night? Hold your hand up. Okay, I'll say it for you. I was invited in 2015, eight years ago, by a group of men uh, at the church I was pastoring at the time, Calvary Bible Church of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And they said, we've succeeded, well, one of them, I only talked to one, he says, I represent eight guys, and he said, we've succeeded, we're in our 30s, we own our own companies, our wives live in pottery barn houses, we have everything, except we realize the missing part. They said, we sat around and said, it's time to get serious about God. I, w I thought, wow, to find someone in their 30s that's going to get serious about God. So I met with him for the next two years, and I said, we'll survey the whole Bible. I'll give you what is equivalent to a, because I taught seminary at the Master's Seminary with John MacArthur, and of course I teach at the Bible Institutes here. I said, I'll give you a Bible Institute level education if you'll meet with me once a week at, you know, at 6 a.m. they picked, and do your homework. And so we did, and so that's, that's what this, the first year was this. The second year, we went into uh, theology and other things, but we went through the 52 greatest chapters. Here they are. This is our week. Last night, we did John 1. Tonight, or I mean this morning, we're doing John 3, and tomorrow, Lord willing, John 10, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for those of you that like to do more, the list of the chapters is right there on the left. A size that you can see and print is on that Facebook page. Uh, it's just called The 52 Greatest Chapters. And in the photo part, you can download the how to do it. That's the lower right, and the left side is the list. Uh, and you can also, you know, Facebook's amazing. You can even uh, do whatever you do, and it will tell you whenever we add to it. But here's where we are. Jesus, evangelism, and the greatest verse in the Bible. I did that on the 30th week with these men. And by the way, since I did it, I did it at Panera, uh, Starbucks, Chipotle, and different offices where we would meet. And no one was there but us and the Lord and our Bibles. And so later on, in a studio, I did these classes, the exact same ones, because uh, the men said we want to keep doing this and they wanted to watch it over again. So let's talk about what it means uh, John 3 and what it contains. It contains the most well-known verse, John 3, 16. For God, and God is the greatest lover, so loved, and that's the greatest love that could be possible, and we have a whole generation of people that don't feel loved and young people that feel detached, and they, meet, they need to meet the greatest lover who has the greatest love. And the world is the greatest company. Remember, God loved the world, and let's be very careful to let God define who the world is. And the world is, Jesus said, look unto me, all the ends of the earth, in Isaiah 45, 22. And God gave, and that is the greatest event of all time. We're going to study that in a couple days in John 19 and 20. His only begotten son, for God to give his son, is the greatest gift that is possible, that whosoever... You know what's so interesting? The, the posture of the biblical characters or figures or people mentioned in the Bible toward sharing salvation. Do you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5? I beg you, be reconciled to God. You know, it's interesting that the one quoted the most in all of the you know, election predestination controversy, Paul, his view of salvation was he begged people to come to Christ. Isn't that interesting? And if Paul did, we should too. That's the greatest offer of all time. Believeth in him, that's the greatest simplicity. In fact, we're going to look at how Jesus illustrates that simplicity. Should not perish. And by the way, I was talking this morning uh, with some of you before, uh, Salvation is not only a future thing. It says in Hebrews 7, 16, we're supposed to live today after the power of an endless life. People should see in us this endless life. When you know you're going to live forever, you live differently. And that's the greatest security. And finally, but have everlasting life. Well, Bonnie and I travel all the time, and so we... Uh, got into TPA, that's what they call Tampa. We know all the three-letter codes all over the world. So we got into TPA, and it was midnight. It was a horrible flight. We had been on it and off it, and something went wrong. You know, they're always fixing something these days. 
and then they didn't have the crew or the crew waited too long. They have, you know, they can only work so many hours in a day. It's all the complications of travel. But we got here at midnight. And of course, I'd sat too long on that plane. You know how after a while you can smell the lavatories, everything. And um, I said, honey, you know what I need? She said, I know what you need. And so we were driving, and I went, oh, there was a 7-Eleven. Did you know, really close to TPA, Tampa Airport, there's a 7-Eleven. It's kind of like, I guess, where you get gas when you return your rental car. And so at midnight, I go into this 7-Eleven, and I got my milk, my dollar bottle of milk that they charge two eighty three dollars for nowadays. And I was standing there, and I was bewildered because I'd been up all night, and there was a plexiglass little hole that you spend money to when a person behind me. They had three different credit card machines. And so I looked at all three, they all went up, I had my credit card and my milk, and I leaned into the hole and I said, ma'am, which one do I use? Because I didn't want to overpay or do the wrong thing. And as I was talking, I hadn't noticed anyone behind me. I heard a voice saying, Dr. Barnett, I would recognize your voice anywhere. And I turned around, and there was a guy wearing, what do they call those things, do-rags or whatever, the biker thing, you know? And the muscle shirt, and the tattoos, and the black leather. And I thought, I don't remember you. Uh, <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, and the biggest smile, he said, I'm a trucker. He said, I've never seen you before. He says, I listen to YouTube. I don't watch it because I'm driving. He says, I, during COVID, he says, I got so hopeless and everything. He says, I just was looking for something. And he said, I started hearing you talking about God. He said, I got saved in my rig. And he said, I've never met you, but I heard your voice when you said, which machine do I use? He said, I could tell your voice in the dark anywhere. You know what? What that reminded me of, anyone, anywhere, I mean, someone in the darkness of the interstate highway system, running those rigs, trying to earn a living, especially with all the regulations that we went through during COVID, this guy was trying to provide for his family, and he reached out. Remember, God, it says in Acts 17, is only an arm's length away from everybody. So this week... Uh, I mean, this session, we're going to look at how to be sharing the gospel. Um, remember, this is something I'm just saying to remind you, if you've never done it, before you go to glory, I would take the time to go through every chapter of the Bible. There are only 1,189. It only takes 72 hours to read the Bible. And actually title every chapter of the Bible, your own title. And write down what you find in that chapter. Because every chapter is the word of God breathed out. And then ask God to do what it says in your life. It's transformational. Well, we're going to do that right now uh, about the miracle being born again in John 3. Now, remember where John 3 is. I told you this last night. John 3 fits right between those seven sign miracles that we covered last night. Remember the Cana, the turning water into wine, and then the healing of the nobleman's son? John 3 is right between there. Also, on Facebook, you can download this chart of the 250 events in the life of Christ in the Gospels. It harmonizes. The Gospel is called a harmony of the Gospels. There are 250 events. See the numbers going down the left? We're looking at number 24 and 25. Nicodemus visits Jesus in the, in the, at night in Jerusalem, John 3, 1 to 21. And John the Baptist tells us more about Jesus uh, going through verse 36, okay? Okay. Uh, Remember, to understand the Bible, you have to understand the context. Uh, the geographic context is one of them. There's a historical context. There's the language, you know, the, the philological or the, the, the etymological or whatever. The Greek and Hebrew words, you have to look at that. You have to look at the scriptural context. But let's just for a minute look at John 3 geographically, because I think it's fascinating. Uh, the first miracle... Uh, the wedding at Cana in John 2 precedes Nicodemus. Then Jesus, in verse 12, moves to Capernaum and sets up his headquarters there. And then the Jerusalem events start. And do you remember the cleansing of the temple? He purges and overturns the tables and, and everything. Then, 
after he gets the attention of the temple aristocracy by purging and cleaning the temple, one of them comes to visit him. And that's the setting for Nicodemus. And uh, then, of course, Jesus tarries. Uh, we know he's baptized. John the Baptist gives his last testimony. That's Capernaum. That's the latest archaeological uh, rendering. In fact, you can see now when the water goes down in the Sea of Galilee, you can see those uh, piers going out. They're stone piers. Uh, and, and, you know, many times we've sat and had our services. We even have communion there because Jesus did the bread of life discourse in that synagogue you can see there. But that's what Capernaum looks like on the Sea of Galilee. And if you go on around the bend from Capernaum up there, you can see Bethsaida and all of that in the entrance of the Jordan River coming from the Lake Hula into the Sea of Galilee. That's the geographic context. By the way, how many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand. How many of you wish you could go to Israel? Raise your hand. I have good news for you. Everyone is going on a tour to Israel on horseback. Jesus is leading the tour, okay? <laughs> uh, and, and it's when we come on uh, horses behind him so you can go. But for any of you that don't want to go, Bonnie and I have taken 2,500 people physically to the land of the book. And we have gone on the buses with them, walked, taught, and I, I did it for years and loved it. I mean, my very first group I took to Israel was 100 people. John MacArthur gave me two busloads and said, take them. And I said, great. That was in 1987. And I've just been loving. That was my second trip, and it was wonderful. But on our last trip that, that we led people on, I took seven a seven-person crew, and they filmed the whole trip. The 52 greatest sites in the Holy Land. And now it's on YouTube. It's right there. Uh, you can actually go. And, and from the comfort of your living room or your office, or if you're a trucker, from your cab, you know, and uh, it's an amazing year-long journey. But Jesus comes down from Capernaum to Jerusalem, and this is what the temple looked like in the time of Christ. 40 acres uh, of incredible architectural grandeur built by Herod, because as you know, Herod inherited his family copper mines on Cyprus, and so he was mega uber wealthy because of his father and grandfather. And so he plowed a lot of money into this, and it was smart because it really upped the economy because people, it was like a magnet, and Jews from Diaspora came and left all their treasures there at Jerusalem's temple. Okay, if we're studying John 3, Jesus explains the gospel. By the way, every time I title a chapter, I title it different because I think about different things. But Nicodemus, the context is Nicodemus is coming to Jesus at night. Uh, it's an evening visit by a, a seeking Bible teacher. Nicodemus of the New Testament may have been, if you read history, Nicodemus known in secular history as Nicodemus Ben-Gurion. If so, he was the third richest man of the first century. In, I mean, of course, Herod was the richest. His brother was Josephus Ben-Gurion. You ever heard of Josephus? Uh, this is from Encyclopedia Jataica. It doesn't matter, those things, but he was somebody. Here's the first lesson. Look at John 3 in your Bible. We're going to read it. And by the way, when, we, when I did this, I sat across the table from those eight men, and, and we studied the Bible. And when they filmed it, they filmed it so that it's like I'm sitting at a table across from the Bible study. But there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, John 3, 1, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and no one can do the sign. There's that word again. John 20 says that the signs that are recorded, the seven of them in the Gospel of John, written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through his name. Then it says in chapter 2, which we're not covering, the first sign Jesus did, that was the miracle at Cana. Now John says, nobody could do these signs that you're doing. So there were others that aren't recorded, but the seven that are recorded are recorded for us. Uh, the signs that you do, verse 2, unless God is with him. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly I say to you, now, you talk about bewildering a genius. I mean, here's this genius of the Bible that knew it in and out, was meticulously obeying it in every way, pharisaically, you know, even counting the leaves on their herb plants and taking every tenth leaf off. 
You want to bewilder him? Say this to him. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Number one, you know what Jesus was saying? Salvation is supernatural. You know, I've pastored all over the country. Started in Georgia, you know, in the, the south and the Southern Baptist Church down there. I was a youth pastor there. Then I went from there, you know, to Grace Community Church, the mega church in Los Angeles. And then I went to New England to Quidnessa Church. And then I went from there to Tulsa Bible Church. And then I went from there up to Calvary Bible Church. You know what I found in, in all those churches? People that when you ask them how they got saved, they go, oh, I have my baptism certificate. I thought, your baptism certificate. Is it the one where your parents baptized you or is it the one where you got baptized? I, so you're, and they would have them on the wall framed, their baptism certificate. Others would tell me, oh, I prayed the prayer. Oh, so that's how you get to heaven, you pray the prayer. And most of them, it was what they had done. That's not what Jesus said. Salvation is something you can't do, only God can do. Now you respond to it, but you can't do it. It's supernatural. And salvation is by faith and it's not by study, it's a supernatural work of God. So there's lesson one, okay? Keep going. Look at verse four. And Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's why people want to get baptized. Born of water. You know, I've got to be baptized. And that's the whole, by the way, that was the first heresy in the church. Baptismal regeneration. By the second century, it was rampantly widespread. That if you just get baptized, and see the idea is, Moses had circumcision, so if you had the physical operation of circumcision, you were going to heaven. And then, John the Baptist started this baptism thing, and Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, and then baptize them, and so you've got to be baptized. And it became this heresy in the church, partly because of this, born of water, and of uh, the blood uh, I mean, and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse six, that which is born of the spirit is, or of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse seven, don't marvel, I say, you must be born again. And then Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. What's he talking about? The spirit blows conviction. By the way, if you're ever gonna lead someone to Christ, you can't do it if the Holy Spirit is not engaged in convicting them of their sin. See, we have to. That's why prayer is so important. That's why walking in the Spirit is so important. That's why everybody I've ever led to the Lord, there's been this amazing awareness that God has gone before and orchestrated the way. Well, what's the, the lesson here? God transforms us from the inside out. That's what salvation is. Uh, Jesus comes in, transforms us on the inside, which no one can see, and gradually everyone starts seeing a change on the outside. By the way, if Jesus transforms you on the inside, it will show up on the outside. You know, it's kind of like cancer. It can be hidden for so long and then it can't be. Every disease is like that. It kind of works away unseen and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, that's what salvation is like in a positive sense. Salvation involves outward changes, water. Uh, that's what he said, uh, born of water and of the spirit. Uh, the outward change, that's why we have baptism. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward transformation. By the way, baptism is an act of obedience. That was another thing. I remember pastoring one church, and uh, it was in a uh, Dutch Reformed area where everybody had been baptized as a baby, I don't know, at eight days old or something like that, kind of portraying circumcision at the eighth day. And all these, these kids have been baptized by their parents and they wear these beautiful outfits. You should see the baptismal outfit. They hang down to the floor, you know. And then they're confirmed, at, you know, at, I don't know, how old, 12, something like that. Everyone, almost everybody in the church had, had been like that. And I started preaching along about this and they all came and said, oh, I was baptized. They said, as a believer? They go, I don't know if I was a believer. I was eight days old. I said, you weren't a believer. I said, you've never been baptized. Your parents dedicated you or something. It's not bad what they did. It's just not baptism. They went, 
Well, first they got angry. And then they went, are you sure? And then I took them through the book of Acts and showed them every baptismal account in the book of Acts. You know, that's why Bible study is so much fun. You can look at every salvation presentation, you can look at every baptism description, and if you do that, all of a sudden, you know everything there is to know about that. You don't need systematic theology so it's thick to understand baptism because it's portrayed in the book of Acts. Do you know what it says in Acts? Everyone in the book of Acts is baptized when? After they what? Yeah, after they believe and get saved. And that's what the water is. It's an outward display. Old Testament purification only happened by the spirit inward, supernatural new heart. What am I talking about? Well, Jews had baptism. They had, they had proselyte baptism. If you decided you were going to follow the God of the Bible in Judaism, you went through a proselyte baptism. And a proselyte baptism uh, was your choice, and you, you publicly did it, and you would go in the mikvah oat, you know, those steps down, you'd go in the water and you would say, I'm dirty and I need to be cleansed in the water and you would do proselyte baptism. So Jesus said, the Holy Spirit has to do something on the inside and then you have to outwardly manifest that. What did Paul say? Acts 26, 18. Paul's testimony. A new, Jesus said to Paul, a new heart I will give you. That's supernatural. A new spirit I will put within you. That's internal change. I'll take away the stony heart out of you. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a heart that is soft and responds to the spirit. God transforms us from the inside out. By the way, that guy at 7-Eleven. If I'd have seen him by the dumpster outside of 7-Eleven, I would have run to my car and hit the lock button. But seeing him inside that radiant smile, those eyes looking right at you, just, wow, the internal transformation. Okay, let's go to verse 9. What time? 10.02? Oh, good. We have a little more time. Okay, let's go to verse 9. You know, I could do this all day. When I'm overseas, they don't have Rich Andrews there, and they just... I've done six successive hours with potty breaks. I mean, Bonnie and I just were invited. We went to a little silver mining town right outside of Mexico City where they grow cilantro. Uh, and they said, everyone came here by bus. Most of them traveled 12 to 16 hours. They want all they can get. We only have you two days. We're going from morning to night. Wow. That, I've never heard that in America. <laughs> Ever. Uh, okay, Nicodemus, verse 9, answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and, and you do not receive our witness. I have, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. This is fascinating. And this is something that, that most people need to think about. Truth must get from our head to our heart. Did you know many, many, many church-attending people miss heaven by 18 inches? Uh, the distance between knowing it and actually embracing it. Jesus challenged Nicodemus, who knew so much to reach out by faith. I remember when a, a lady dragged her husband, oh, she was creative, dragged her husband into my office because she said, I want to do a vow renewal for our 50th anniversary. So that means she, they were between 68 and 70 something because it was their 50th anniversary. And I said to her, I said, what are you doing? She said, just do what you normally do. I said, what? She said, what you normally do with couples. You've said it from the pulpit that, that you always talk about when you do weddings and someone wants to be married, you tell them, now your wedding is the second greatest day of your life. And people, I say that at weddings all the time. I've done hundreds of weddings. And people sit out in the audience. They think, what, is this a remarriage? What do you mean the second greatest day? And I go, the first and greatest day is what? Salvation, yeah. And so everybody that comes to get married, I say, before we talk about 
The second greatest day of your life, getting married, or doing your vow renewal, remembering the second greatest day, let's take a few moments to talk about what? The first greatest day. She said, you're gonna do that for us, aren't you? I said, oh, now I saw what she was doing. Her husband was a church attending. I mean, he was, everybody at the church knew and loved him. He was about the most faithful guy in church. He gave, he served, and everything else. But the one who lived with him knew secretly he had fears and struggles, and she knew he wasn't a Christian. Even though he said he was, and even though you know, he'd gone to church his whole life, and, and they came to us from the Methodist church where he'd been on all the boards and everything else, he just was a good guy. Believed up here, knew, I should say, all the facts, but it never had transformed him on the inside. And so that deadly 18-inch gap from head to heart was in his. So in, in my office, I said, hey, before we talk about the vow renewal, I said, let's, that's the second greatest day of your life. I said, it was 50 years ago, right? I said, well, let's talk about the first greatest day of your life. And he just, and then he looked at his wife. He knew he had been cornered. It was like a deer in the blind when they hear, you know, I'm a hunter. I don't wear my hunting clothes, but I'm a hunter. Uh, his eyes got wide, and I just said, can I talk about, I said, would you like to reaffirm, before you do your vows, reaffirm the truth about the greatest day in your life? And I opened my Bible. In, um, in my Bible, I have marked in the very front page, right up here, Romans 3.10. Ah, the Romans Road. And I moved over to Romans 3. And I turned my Bible around, and I said to him, it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And in my Bible, I turned around, and I said, can you read what it says right there? Number one, he said, we all have sinned. He said that out loud. I said, do you believe that? He says, oh, he says, I'm the worst sinner I know. I said, well, that's good. Boy, his wife was just like this, you know, and, and the, she was so excited. I said, okay, now look over at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I said, so what does it say right there? He said, he looked at my Bible, we all are sinners. Then I turned him to chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I said, could you read what it says right there by number 2 in my Bible? And he looked, kind of went like that, you know, that movement. It says, Christ died for sinners. He said that out loud. I said, that's true. I said, what did you just tell me? You're the worst, what? Sinner that I know. I said, okay, real quickly. And, and right there I have 623, and so I moved over to 623, and this is what it says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I said, what does it say right there? by that 23rd verse. Number three, what does it say? Read it out loud. And he went, salvation is a gift. And I usually have my pen right here in my shirt. It's part of my soul winning equipment. <laughs> I have it right there. And when we get to that point, I say, let me show you what a gift is. I pull out my pen, I said, here you go. I said, what do you have to do to get that? And usually, most people will just reach out. And as they reach out, I hold on to my end, and I said, that'll be 10 bucks. And they always do the same thing. They pull their hand away. I say, that's not a gift, is it? If you have to pay for it, it isn't a gift. I said, what does it say right there? Number three, read it again. And he said, salvation is a gift. Then very quickly, I flipped over to chapter 10, verse 10. I said, let me read you 10, 9, and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I said, what, what does it say right there, number four? I said, he took my Bible, and he said, ask Jesus to save you. And I said, have you ever asked Jesus to save you? 
He sat right on the edge of the couch. He said, no. I said, what would keep you? Do you know why most people never lead anybody to the Lord? They, they don't ever do that closer. What would keep you from right now asking Jesus to save you? And I, I could see movement out of the corner of my eye, so I looked at his wife. When I looked back, he was gone. I thought, he left. He was down on his knees with his head on the carpet of my office. Kind of like, you ever seen them praying toward Mecca on their, on their um, carpets? You know, they get down and they put their heads down. He, I mean, this Navy sailor was very serious. And right there, on his 50th anniversary renewal prep, he got the greatest day of his life before he celebrated the second greatest day. Truth in his life and in our lives has to get from our head to our heart. Okay, real quickly. 18 minutes, Rich. Number four. Look what it says in verse 14. As, now this, I bet, you've never used in your soul winning presentation. The greatest soul winner of all time, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, how did he present salvation? Never in the way we do. Isn't it amazing? What did he say in verse 14? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. When's the last time you even thought about that event? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's verses 14 and 15. Jesus went to the heart of the gospel. My substitute bore my sin. Jesus became sin. That's what the serpent was. It was a picture of sin. And was lifted up to bear God's wrath in my place. You know, that's the most beautiful part of the third chapter. This whole serpent lifted up message of salvation. And by the way, salvation, once you get saved, and that's what really uh, Bonnie was going, remember I told you about that speaker she was sitting next to on the bumpy ride into uh, Dulles Airport uh, yesterday. Uh, she was talking about salvation means we have an appointment. Do you know what Hebrews 9.27 says? It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Everybody senses this appointment we have with death. But for Christians, it says in Psalm 23.4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. Why? Well, did you catch what that said? Everybody, before death comes, when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, Who's right there with us? Why? Yeah, so Jesus, I don't know if you heard that. That's true. That's what all of us should have answered. Why? Because he has an, a personal appointment with us. You know, I was, uh, the pastor that preceded me at Tulsa Bible Church uh, was an amazing guy from Philadelphia College of the Bible and church planner and camp starter and rapture believer. And he was 90-some years old and he was still attending church, always sat leaning against this pillar because he couldn't sit up straight because he was so old and had every kind of ailment. But he gradually began to get depressed the older he got because he believed in the rapture and he started thinking he was going to miss it. You know, he was going to die instead of getting raptured. Did you catch the difference in my voice? Die instead of raptured. You know, one is positive, the other is negative. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Willard, that was his name. I said, Willard. Did you know there are two raptures? Bible teacher all his life, PCB graduate, he went, <clears throat> he was starting to defend the faith. He said, two raptures. I said, mm-hmm. There is the group rapture, second th or First Thessalonians 4, and there's the private, individual, personal rapture, Psalm 23, 4. Hebrews 9, 27. I said, you are going to miss the group one, but guess what? You get the personal, private, Jesus coming to meet you. And before, the, as the valley of death's shadow opens, before you start down that valley, he shows up and says, I will, don't fear any evil. I'm with you. I'm going to walk you through the valley. And not just through the valley. What does verse 6 say? And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, 
my substitute who bore my sin makes a personal appointment with me as the good shepherd to walk me safely home. So where did this snake thing come from that Jesus uses? See the red box? Uh, remember the children of Israel over there, number one, uh, take off and go to Succoth and then Pithhiroth, and then they cross the Red Sea and then they start down and the bitter water at Mara and Elam and they're, they're complaining and the doves and then they have the giving of, you know, by the time you get to seven, eight, and nine, they have the giving of the law and all that. And then, uh, you know, they, they are bad and so the Lord says, you're going to wander for 40 years and they start wandering for 40 years. And then they get the signal, it's time to go to the promised land, and they, they come up to Et Zion Geber, and God says, no, no, you can't, you can't go through, you have to go around Edom and Moab, remember all that stuff, all that Old Testament history. And they really get angry, and that's Numbers 21, and the, the serpents. Okay, so... Let's look at this, starting in verse 16. So in that context of the serpent being lifted up in Numbers 21, 4 to 9, Jesus says this to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Wow. God is a loving savior. Salvation is prompted by God's love. What does Ephesians 2, 4 say? For God who is rich in mercy with his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were, you all know this, dead in our trespasses and sin. For by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. God is love. God is a savior. You know, we always think of Jesus as the savior. But God calls himself a savior. In fact, in the book of Titus, Paul calls him God the savior. Jesus is just a reflection of Jesus, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is just a reflection of God the Father, who is the Savior, and Jesus is our Savior. Okay, starting in verse 19, look what salvation does. And this is a condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But everyone practicing evil hates the light. That's the culture we live in. And does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. You know what salvation is? We get turned from darkness to light. Now for just a minute, look at Luke chapter 1. This is really neat. Back up in your Bible to Luke 1. Oh, I heard two pages. Okay. Uh, Here we go. Luke 1 and verse 79. This is God's description of Christ's coming. Um, It actually starts in um, uh, verse 78. Through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring, the sunrise from on high is visited. God calls Jesus the sunrise, the day spring. Verse 79. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. Do you know how the Bible presents us? We were born loving and seeking darkness. It's like we're all sitting on the edge of a precipice, a cliff, and at the bottom is the lake of fire, and we are blind. We're in the dark, so even if we could see, it was still dark, and we're sitting right on the edge, and close to toppling over into destruction eternally. And Jesus comes and passes by us, kind of like chapter 5 of the Gospel by John we already looked at yesterday, the paralytic laying there, helpless. And Jesus stops and leans over his bed and said, "Um, do you like laying here? Do you want to get up? Would you like to be healed? You understand? That's that's how the Bible presents salvation. And Jesus, the instant that we reach out to him, Paul calls it groping for God, reaching out, saying, I need you, I want you. He turns us. When, When I was saved, I was drawn to the light, and I want any evil in my life exposed 
and I want to forsake it. That's what Paul said. I already quoted Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. That's what salvation is. We get turned from darkness to light. We become light lovers. We don't want to, and we get as far away from the edge of the cliff as possible. I mean, we're going along the edge trying to lead other people to the Lord, but we don't like the dark and the, the whole scene. Okay, uh, look at John's testimony, starting in verse 22. Uh, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came, John 3, to the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem. For John, verse 24, hadn't been yet thrown into prison. And there was a dispute. And look at verse 27. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. All ministry comes from God. John taught that it was God who gives, who calls, and bless his ministry. I meet people all the time. They wish they had somebody else's ministry. Remember, I was a pastor for years. I still am a pastor, but I was vocationally a pastor for years. Everybody I met wanted to be someone else. They wanted to be John Piper, or they wanted to be Billy Graham, or they wanted to be, you know, Ray Comfort, or they wanted to be somebody. And I said, you know, they wanted to be, you know, I don't know who the, they wanted to be Jack Wurtson. You know what I mean? I said, why don't you just be you? God called and gifted and created you, as Ephesians 2 says, unto good works that he designed, and, and he is doing everything he can to do that through you, and you want to be someone else? There's something only you can do. That's why these, these uh, 52 greatest chapter Bible studies are springing up all over. One of the greatest things, I mean, every morning uh, I get up and, and, you know, wash my face, but I don't get any of that water from Sarasota County in my nose. Have any of you read that? Yeah, yeah the brain-eating amoeba, amoeba that's in Fort Myers. How many of you know about that? Okay, don't wash your face and splash it in your nose but I'm ready to go to heaven, so I splashed anyway this morning. I said, if it's time, I'm ready. But then I go to my computer, pop it open, and I read, like I just read. They said, I live in uh, the island, you know, Ireland, uh, southern Ireland, the, the uh, Roman Catholic part, and they said, and I found the 52 greatest chapters, and you said, just start sharing what you're doing with someone else. And at work, I shared that I was learning all this stuff about God. And they said, man, I've gone to Catholic Church my whole life, never learned anything about God personally. How do you do it? And they said, well, come over and we'll have coffee. And, and they led them to the Lord. And then they had two in their Bible study. And then both of them went to work and started telling people what they were learning. You see, they weren't called to, to leave Southern Ireland and do something. They were called by God to do what only they could do. There's only their job and their people they know and their way of sharing the gospel. All ministry comes from God. And as long as you're living and breathing, check in with him. By the way, in my little room, it was totally dark. I slipped out of bed. As soon as my feet hit those beautiful tile floors they have in the rooms that the speakers stay in, I paused and I said, Lord, I can't believe you gave me another day to live. I'm checking in. What do you want me to do? Is that how you started your morning? That's how we're all supposed to start our morning. Check in. I want to serve you all of my days. Okay. Oh, six minutes left. Let's go to verse 30. Okay. Um, oh. Starting in John 3, verse 30. This is a lot. He must increase, but I must decrease. I love that. That's the goal of life. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth and comes from heaven is above all. Uh, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What I love, I mean, I could go into the humility passage, and Paul clearly says in Colossians 3 that we're supposed to clothe ourselves with humility. By the way, see my shirt? Everybody look at my shirt. This shirt was totally wrinkled, and my wife ironed it, put it on a hanger and said, honey, I do not want you at Word of Life Florida. All of those people down there will notice that your wife neglects you if you have a wrinkled shirt. And so I carried it, hung it up, carefully put it on. I, but what I'm saying is, I put it on this morning. 
Do you know what the Bible says, Colossians 3, 12 to 14? Do you know what you and I are supposed to put on every day? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, humility. The whole list, but humility is a chosen clothing that we wear. But uh, that's the he must increase, but I must decrease. But look at this. I have everlasting life and no longer need to fear the wrath of God. What does Hebrews 7, 16 say? That those who get saved live after the power of an endless life. Whoa. We live after the power of an endless life and people should see Christ reflected in us. Okay, in summary, um, when Jesus met the most religious person of his day, where did he take him to? Back to Numbers 21. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to show him salvation and what he should be sharing. Number one, God's sufficiency. The lifted up brass serpent was all that was needed to supply salvation. Do you ever think about that? God has made a sufficient salvation, and that's what Jesus was pointing to. Looking back at Numbers 21, the snake's venom was deadly, just like sin is. And each person had burning pain reflecting how desperate their need was. Did you know this story? I love, I love the, the serpent in the wilderness because it's the perfect picture of salvation. God has sufficient offer, the lifted up serpent. They were hopeless. Those people, do you know when you get that sand viper bite, you start vomiting, you're paralyzed, you start having all of these uh, terrible convulsions. They were hopeless. By the way, everybody that got bitten died. Now God's power. See, this is where we don't, take, we don't slow down enough to think about this. Jesus said, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, let's talk about the Son of Man being lifted up. Where was the Son of Man lifted up? In Jerusalem, about A.D. 30. Boy, that was 2,000 years ago. Did any of you see it? Yeah, you watched the Passion of the Christ or, you know, the Jesus video. You weren't there. What about this event? Numbers 2 tells us there were 603,550 families in numbers when this event took place. That many families. Hey, thanks for turning that off. That means we get longer. Isn't it like I just got a renewal? That's not what happened. Turn them back off. There were 603,550 families camping in tents. Do you know how much room it is to have a tent, to have your animals, to have your cart that you go in, to have a little spot because you had to have your family spread out and your little fire and cook and everything? Did you know just using the KOA, you know, the basic campground rules for state parks and everything, do you know how much area to have 603,000 campsites would take? An area nine miles by nine miles. Minimum, if the people were just all, you know, with their little campsites touching each other. Why am I saying that? Well, the, the snake on the wooden pole was in the middle of the camp. Moses put it up. That means that if you were at the periphery, that pole was four and a half miles from you. And you were laying on the ground vomiting and writhing and foaming and you certainly couldn't see anything. And someone had to come down on their knee and say, hey, I just heard that Moses put a serpent, a brazen serpent on a pole, and, it's, and you would turn their little twisted body and say, it's that way, and if you'll look that way, God will save you. And guess what? Everyone who looked at the direction of the pole instantly no more vomiting, foaming, writhing, convulsions. They were saved. Wow. God's power. One snake on a pole worked no matter how many bites or how bad their condition or how far they were away. There's the old Sunday school picture of this. I mean, look at, just think of being four and a half miles off in those mountains. Basically, oh, it's 10.02. Their personal need... God's perfect solution, God's reliability, God's simple plan. It was an easy, instant look. That's all that was required. But it had to be at the only source of health. 
Oh, come on, I want to get to the last slide. No, I don't want to take my time. This is being recorded forever that I'm going over time. What does a brazen serpent point at? The reason we should go out soul winning every day? We all have a similar deadly infection. All infected will die. Everyone poisoned by the serpents would die, and everyone infected by the SIN virus will die. I was just at um, uh, this restaurant, I forget the name of it, uh, but uh, I, I was with the staff of a church, and I was showing them how to witness, and the waitress came up, you know, it's the one where they have the Tower of Onion Rings about this high, and all those sauces to dip in it. And I was there doing that, and the waitress came up to me, because she could tell I was paying, and she said, uh, I'm gonna be serving the group, and I said, did you know all these guys are convicts? She looked at, and she looked at the guys and she backed up and she, then she came over to me and she said, what kind of convicts, what did they do, you know? I said, they're all guilty convicts. And then I went right into guess what? They're all infected with the SIN virus, it's terminal. And they were all headed to death. And then I start sharing the gospel. We have a similar cure. There's only one cure, Jesus Christ. A similar choice. Only God's way will work. And that's why we have God's simple plan of salvation. And so this is what I end with. Have you marked your Bible? Did you notice what I did a few minutes ago with the guy doing the vow renewal? Are you ready? Do you have a Bible with you? You have your charge cards, you know, your credit cards with you. Charge card shows how old I am, you know. Credit cards with you. You have your phone so you can do your payment and scan and touchless. Do you prepare every day to share the gospel? When's the last time you verbally shared the gospel with someone? Do you have in your wallet a gospel track? Right here's mine that I just prayed over this week. My favorite one's called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. I mean, you can get it almost any language of the world. You can fold it up and put it in your purse or your pocket or your wallet or something. Do you really want to take someone with you to heaven? It's the only thing you can take from earth are people. And that's why when I met the man at 7-Eleven, I thought God can save anyone, anywhere, anytime if they'll just reach out to Christ. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the uh, greatest verse in the Bible, one of the most precious chapters of the Bible, John 3, for the wonder of our salvation that we have opened eyes, we've been turned from darkness to light, we've been set free from the power of Satan. But we're supposed to live no longer for ourselves, but unto you, Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5. And I pray in this vast group of your servants that you would stir all of our hearts to really ask ourselves, when's the last time I sought to verbally lead someone to Christ, shared a gospel witness, and found someone laying there writhing and paralyzed with the snake bite of sin and pointed them to that cross where if they would look, they could live. I pray that would be the desire of our hearts. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen.